Um, we are very delighted to have with us tonight somebody who knows Michael Jackson very, very well. Uh, the man who successfully defended Michael Jackson during Michael Jackson's child molestation case, and I'm talking about the one and only attorney, Tom Mesero. Tom, thank you for being here tonight. And this has been a very difficult day for me personally. Um, I, I am a recovering alcoholic with 16 years of sobriety, so I do bring that to the table. That does put a certain a pair of glasses on my eyes because I do see things through the, the context of addiction. And then we hear um, in court that Dr. Arnie Klein, who Michael has known for a long time, remember the, the woman he married, Debbie Rowe, uh, was Dr. Klein's nurse and he married her in 1996, that uh, Dr. Arnie Klein and his office have been giving Michael Jackson what others, other dermatologists and other experts have des described as huge doses of Demerol for Botox and Ristolin, treatments that I personally have had, that I've had with, with no mood-altering substances, that many Americans have had with no mood-altering substances. In one day, uh, th in one day, 300 milligrams. In three days, 900 milligrams of Demerol, which has been compared in strength to a morphine. Um, what do you make of it? Because you were there with Michael Jackson during the toughest times of his life. Well, <clears throat> I met him approximately nine months before the trial started. I worked with him intensely during those nine months with my law firm partner, Susan Yu, who was my co-counsel. We worked with him for five months during that trial, very intensely. I never saw him addicted to anything. I never saw him inarticulate or uncooperative. He was always lucid and clear with me. I never saw him take a drug of any kind. And I'm not prepared to say he was an addict based on my experiences because he wasn't. He was working very diligently and intelligently and clearly with Susan and I as we prepared the defense to his criminal case. Those are my direct experiences. I well, never saw an addicted person. One of the things that's so complex about Michael Jackson, and, and I am a huge fan of his, I think he is and was a musical genius, and he's with the musical greats of all time, so I have no <laughs> axe to grind. But, but part of it is that you start looking at his history. The fact that in 1993 he did say that he was addicted to painkillers, and there are those uh, including myself, who have always believed once an addict, always an addict, and you're just in recovery. And then there are things like uh, what happened with the Mickey Fine Pharmacy. Uh, there was a lawsuit involving $100,000 of prescription pills or drugs that he ordered that he did not pay for, allegedly, and they ended up settling out of court. The Mickey Fine Pharmacy is very next door, very close to the offices of Dr. Arnie Klein. And now you have these medical records showing that Dr. Arnie Klein gave him Demerol, which is a highly addictive substance. That's why it's a controlled substance. And he even wrote a song uh, about Demerol uh, called Morphine. Michael Jackson did. So how do, you, how do you combine those two disparate portraits? Well, again, I, my experiences are my own. I never saw an addict, and, I, and the person I work with could not have been addicted to anything because he was so clear and articulate and cooperative with me. And this was a tough period. This was a period where you would have expected him to want some, you know, sleeping medication or some anti-anxiety medication or antidepressant medication. Anyone in that position usually goes to a physician and gets something. Now, was he dependent as opposed to an addict? I don't really know. All I can tell you is I never saw an addict uh, that I was representing uh, in Michael Jackson. I never saw a person who couldn't, couldn't articulate, couldn't think clearly, couldn't respond, couldn't cooperate. He would call me at 3 in the morning. He would call me at 4 in the morning. He would call Susan Yu, her, her, you know, my law partner, at 3 or 4 in the morning. He was always lucid and always clear. So as far as the evidence you're describing, does that make him an addict if it's true? Well, I don't know. I'm not the expert. Look, that's a word. And we could sit here and disagree and have uh, an argument over semantics, but uh, how do you explain why he would want these huge quantities of Demerol for Botox and Ristolin? Well, how do you explain why a physician would give him this kind of medication if it's inappropriate? I'm not the physician and I'm not the expert, but I think whatever these physicians actually did should be looked at very closely. And now, none of this exonerates Dr. Conrad Murray for giving him propofol in the home under those horrendous conditions. I mean, we're talking about Demerol, we're talking about 
pain medication. What about what Conrad Murray did? He's the one on trial, as far as I'm concerned. And whether Michael Jackson was addicted or not, whether he was dependent or not, whether he needed help or not, it was Dr. Murray's professional obligation to treat him properly, not to have propofol in the home, not to give it to him without proper, uh, proper equipment or trained personnel, not to leave him alone, not to lie to paramedics, not to lie to police, not to lie to hospital personnel. None of this exonerates Conrad Murray, as far as I'm concerned. Now, there are those who say that Dr. Arnie Klein should be investigated, given what was revealed in court today, the amounts of Demerol he gave Michael Jackson. Again, a controlled substance that is, by the FDA's own definition, highly addictive. Uh, do you think Dr. Arnie Klein should be investigated? I don't know enough about the evidence, to be honest with you. I did hear what was brought up in court today. I don't know Dr. Klein's position, and I don't know what he really did or not. My understanding was there was a question raised in court as to whether the records are even authentic. Well, I we just had don't the attorney know. for Dr. Arnie Klein on just a little while ago, Garo Gazarian, and he did not dispute the records. I mean, look, we can dance around it. Uh, the fact is... Millions of Americans have had Botox and Restylane treatments. They're injections to your face. I've had them. Uh, I'm not proud to sit here and say that. Uh, I mean, I don't care one way or another, really. I stopped taking Botox. But um, I, I didn't have any mood-altering medication. At the most, for Restylane, you have a little local anesthetic around your face that is not mood-altering, that just, you know, makes the little the, the prick of the needle, you don't feel it. But, I mean, let's be real. The idea of giving Demerol for that is akin to giving, in, in some eyes, a uh, heroin for, for a, a root canal. Well, based on what was said in court today, it doesn't sound appropriate, but I don't know Dr. Klein's position, and I don't know what he really gave him and what the purposes were. I've never had Botox, but in my family, there was a history of alcoholism, but the alcoholics drank alcohol. I never saw Michael Jackson take anything. I just never did. So why Nor did he seem to be, be acting as if uh, he had taken something. Okay, and, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Tom. I mean, I appreciate you, you being here. And, and we'd actually scheduled this interview before this day, which was perhaps the most controversial day of the trial on, on some levels. But um, when somebody says, hey, you've got a, a, like a $100,000 bill at, at uh, Mickey Fine Pharmacy uh, for prescriptions, uh, other people would draw a conclusion, well, then the person who has used 19 aliases to get prescription drugs, which is what the estimates are that Michael Jackson used, 19 aliases, has a problem on some level. Well, the information you've just described is disturbing, but what does it have to do with contract Murray, uh, Dr. Murray? What does it have to do with, uh, with, with propofol? What does it have to do with him, him not being candid with paramedics who arrived to try and revive him? It has nothing to do with as far as I'm concerned. It's the defense trying to devalue Michael Jackson, demean him, try and make him look like a hopeless addict who is making his own decisions and to try and exonerate their client. And I hope, I hope it doesn't work. How do you think the defense and the prosecution are doing? Give us a grade for each side. The prosecution gave a very strong, compelling, clear, logical case, and they made things very understandable for this jury. The defense had to sit there patiently, as they always do, and get their turn to tell their story. These are professional advocates. They're doing a very aggressive job for their client, which they're supposed to do. I don't think their cross-examination was terribly effective on the prosecution witnesses, and I think the witnesses they're calling are a, are a mixed bag. You know, they're giving them some of the things they want, but they're also paying a price for all of them. I think in the end, the focus is going to be on what Conrad Murray did to Michael Jackson, not what other doctors did or whatever weaknesses Michael Jackson may have had. Look, uh, and we're going to show some video of Michael Jackson as we talk about this. Uh, I, again, I have uh, no desire to say anything that is unflattering about Michael Jackson. I, I, I was very fair, and I think that's one of the reasons you talked to me when we covered the Michael Jackson child molestation trial, when a lot of people said, oh, he's going to be convicted. I said, I have no idea. I don't know. And it turns out he was acquitted on all counts. And a lot of the things that people said about him were not true and were very mean and nasty. But I also do it a service to myself as a person who focuses on recovery, who's written two books on recovery, not to discuss the issue of addiction if it's staring us in the face in court with an addiction specialist saying, in his opinion, uh, Michael Jackson had developed a dependency on opiates. So um, my concern, uh, Tom, is that by not discussing it or by glossing over it, are we, in essence, becoming part of the problem? Because America has a huge addiction problem. More people are ODing from prescription drugs, legal drugs, than they are from illegal drugs. 
Well, there was an article in the L.A. Times recently that more Americans are dying from prescription drugs than car accidents, which yeah. was the uh, first time in history that's ever been documented. So I completely sympathize with your concern. What I don't want is, is, is for your concerns to obscure what the real issue in this case is, is what did Conrad Murray do to Michael Jackson in his home with a dangerous anesthetic called propofol? And what he did was absolutely outrageous. He didn't know how to use it. He didn't use it properly. He didn't have heart monitoring equipment, breathing equipment. He didn't have a trained anesthesiologist. He left it all around uh, in Michael Jackson's room. And he lied to paramedics, as far as I'm concerned, who wanted to know what Michael had taken so they could try to revive him. Ten seconds. Do you think... Dr. Conroberry is going to get convicted, yes you, or no? You never know what a jury will do. That's you true. really don't. Yeah. But I think the prosecution has presented a very strong case. Thank you, Tom Mesereau. You are a doll for coming on. And again, one, my favorite attorney on the planet, I have to say. I've seen a lot of them. We'll be right back. Thank you. <laughs>